Hello everyone, my name is Ruben Kean. I'm the Curator of Contemporary Asian Art here at the Queensland Art Gallery and Gallery of Modern Art. But I'd like to pay my respects to the traditional owners of this land, the Turbal and Yagara people, and to acknowledge Elders past, present and emerging. I'm joined today by Shubigi Rao, artist based in Singapore, who's participating in the Asia Pacific Triennial of Contemporary Art, APT10, with three works, a small study of silence, a film, uh, the photo work to transects and the drawing set, a total lineal feat of each. Um, Shubigi has, um, has kindly agreed to chat to us today about her work, but um, before we get to those individual works within the APT, Shabigi is one of a number of artists um, in APT whose practice is one that I would call research-based, by which I mean it doesn't typically manifest as a particular uh, kind of media. In fact, um, Shabigi works across a very broad range of media, um, including those which I would say um, move beyond the realm of what is traditionally regarded as contemporary art into fields such as publishing and so on. Um, Shabiki, would I be right to qualify your, your practice as research-based? Um, yes, I think so. I'm pretty lousy at categorizing myself because I'd rather turn that lens outwards. So I think, yes, I, I would agree that your, your perspective is accurate. Now, could you talk about some of the, uh, the different media that you've worked in? I suppose the most not notable um, outside of the realm of contemporary art um, or as an extension of that realm is really the publishing project Pulp. Yes, thank you. Um, it's interesting that you call it a publishing pro uh, project because a lot of people overlook that aspect of it. Um, the Pulp books are, uh, the books that I do are published actually under an uh, a firm that does exist. Um, I was very inspired when the Panama Papers came out by the way um, uh, the, the operation of shelf companies and, and how you nest things under each other. So it's actually a nested company and I can't go into great detail about it. <laughs> but part of the reason is because of the gatekeeping that occurs in the literary world. So I've often seen a number of art, artist books that are very credible literary works in their own right, but they can't be submitted for um, review. They can't be submitted for um, um, prizes um, um, and, and such, you know, and even just they don't get that recognition as works of literature, simply because they regard it as artist books. So this kind of genre gatekeeping always bothered me. And one of the things that I do with my I like the my publishing firm, um, is, which is called Rock, Paper, Fire, is that I, I try and um, bypass these, these means of gatekeeping. Um, and, and I think that the, 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 if the reason for, for this, and I'm glad you brought this up, is because the act of publishing to me is much more interesting than what gets published. Um, with all my media choices, I choose a media because the idea demands it. So in this case, the Pulp Project demanded that I look at means of circumventing um, gatekeeping, proscription, and other forms of silencing or marginalization in, in different degrees, of course, because we have different degrees of marginalization naturally. But in, with my limited um, um, means and, and, and capabilities, I decided that one of the ways I could do this was also to publish works by um, people who can't afford to get, say, a master's in creative writing because they are either working class or they can't afford MA programs, basically. So this was one way to also bypass this whole method. So again, I choose a medium because of the um, of what it of what it does, rather than the aesthetics of, of the or the result or the product, if you if I may put it that way. So in a similar way, I've worked in the past with um, neuroscientific equipment um, and machinery, all of which is, of course, it's all hoaxes. This is in my older, much older work. But the reason was because I was making a point. And, and I like also to learn a brand new medium, sometimes to take a joke too far. So um, with, with the publishing thing, it actually started as a bit of an inside joke, um, everything from the logo to um, the name as well. But, um, and this whole idea of it being a nested company and not actually fully owned by me, but at the same time, there are these layers of obfuscation, so you can never really pin down who actually owns it. I think to me, that's really important because it's very, it's very similar to the opacity um, and obfuscation that, that occurs, I believe, in a lot of fields, which also shut large groups of people out if they're not part of the, a select elite in group. And 
when it, when it comes to making these um, decisions about different media, you, you talk about um, what the project demands. Um, what is the uh, what could I qualify as a sort of central idea that's that's driving that research that goes into poll? Ah, the central idea. Well, <laughs> I never have just one. Yeah. I I mean, but okay, I I will attempt this. Um, there are many different things that led up to this. I suppose this project was brewing for a while, even though I wasn't consciously aware of it. Um, I've seen firsthand from the time I was a child, um, destruction of literary material, um, destruction of culture, often going hand in hand with um, eradication of people and um, communities, um, disruption and, and, and destruction of communities. So I, I think that, and this is something that bothered me a lot, even when I was very, very young. In fact, my, my, one of my, my mother's earliest memories of me is, is me protesting about the unfairness of, of this. I mean, I wouldn't protest if something unfair happened to me because I, I thought it was legitimate that adults could, you know, um, impose on a child. But to me, I couldn't understand how a grown up who I thought was the font of all wisdom could actually sort of, you know, um, be responsible for, for oppression. And I, it could, I couldn't rationalize it as a child. And of course, as you grow up and then you understand the ways of things, um, or at least try to understand it. I realized I was, I was still could not, it didn't sit well. And I, I also understood that the book is, is symbolic of a lot of things here. So the central, I guess the central idea of pulp is this. It's called Pulp, a short biography of the Manish book. And the hint is in the title. Mm -hmm. It's short because it's only 10 years long to deal with the wealth of information that I'm working with. But it's also a biography. So the, it's the book personified. And that is what it means to me. It's not only a material object. It's not only a holder of knowledge and act uh, a way to sort of, um, you know, it's not all these things. A book, by the way, as we also know, can be the progenitor of violence or the impetus for violence so I, I don't valorize books also but I understand that the warring impulses to, to write to share and also to destroy are not oppositional they are very frequently they frequently go hand in hand and that's why um, I'm no longer surprised when authors I've admired turned out to be completely violent in real life because there is this whole idea of what Milton called the potent vial which is the distillation of the human spirit in a book um, it's very easy for us to only hear selectively and read selectively. So this, it is in a sense, if you think about a book, the way I'm approaching it, it is biographical. So I have personified the book as being the potent vial of, of humanity. And I've sort of taken up Leo Lowenthal's um, challenge, which is to psycho psychoanalyze the whole of human, uh, our, hum our species through um, our history of violence, but doing it through the lens of, well, I suppose, book and library um, destruction, um, but this also includes uh, 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 sort of, you know, um, the online format, virtual and sort mm -hmm. of digital um, formats as well. So as I said, 10 years, very, very short <laughs> to deal with all of this. But I suppose the central idea again is, I've often felt that when one cares very deeply about the state of things, it can be, it's very easy to feel despair. I, however, have a very simple motto, and that is, it is not necessary to be effectual in one's time. And one of the reasons I do 10 year long projects is that it, we measure our lives in decades. And I also believe that, I don't think pulp is gonna change anything, um, but I would like to believe that it will, it will last longer than any of my attempts to lecture or anything that I would do, those effects, those actions, um, the writing that I do, they only go so far, but it's possible that the archive, for instance, that I'm building while I'm doing the pulp project will outlast anything that I've attempted to do. So I don't mean legacy here. I mean, the, the ability to motivate change or to infiltrate the seemingly impregnable monoliths of power. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I, 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 it gives me hope in other words. So, like I said, there's no one central idea. There's mm. a lot tied up with this project, but at the, at the heart of it is this, this, it's a bulwark against despair. And that is also what the library is. It's a pushback against forces of singular narrative of, um, you know, uh, you know, all the usual things. So, I mean, I don't have to <laughs> go on a bit about the value of a library, but I'm hoping that this project in a sense is, is it, it's a bolstering mechanism. Mm. I think that that um, that element of hope that you mentioned is something that um, it, 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 it extends beyond um, the pulp project, but um, 
it's that relationship between communication or lack of access to communication um, and the creation of new avenues of communication uh, that I think sort of carries through to um, other aspects of, of, of things that you've been working on. And I um, would like to lead into your, your project as, um, for APT as well, because uh, something that um, I know that we've spoken about is this idea of a breakdown in communication um, and breakdowns in forms of communication that might not necessar necessarily be human ones, uh, but certainly find analogs within the human world. Yes. Thank you, Ruben. Um, in a way, the what I've done for APT um, also comes from a similar place as the PULP project. Um, just very briefly, I grew up, I was very lucky to grow up with the lovely library that my parents had. It was a library actually of scavenged and saved books, mostly rescued books. And um, they, uh, my parents being environmentalists, there was a very, and also bibliophiles and fans of literature and so on. And also, strangely enough, military history. Um, <laughs> um, it, this was all had, had tremendous influence on me. And um, I, I grew up with a lot of books, rare books, um, or natural history books, and so on. I don't think I enjoyed them as much as I, sh I, I now regret that I didn't spend as much time with them. But I was also just a child. And we lost that library in quite a brutal, brutal way. And I think that that really affected me as well. So for many years, I was in a kind of mourning. And I know that definitely influenced the pulp project the initial bits but there was always a part of me that was suspicious of the sentiment and the reason for that is because and i'm very lucky to be living during this time uh when we're talking about things like decolonizing i realized that because i'm only fluent in english i was learning about the flora and fauna and about um, traditional and indigenous um knowledge through the language of the colonizer which is um the british civil servant or, or military officer who would write um uh, about these subjects mm. and most of the natural history books that i adore and most of the naturalists who i admired as a child were actually as i mentioned already um they were either the vanguard uh, because most early naturalists of the 16th, uh, 17th centuries were actually they're really the vanguard for the um, colonizers that followed mm. and most of our natural history books act were, were eventually used to justify the destruction of diverse biomes and only have monocultures of rubber or spices etc which would then go back to the mother country and so on so i mean again this is knowledge i gained later but the, when you look at a beautiful book of natural history which i've and i've filmed many over the years i'm also really aware that this knowledge essentially is is it's it's there's so much that you can say about this and it's again points to this breakdown in communication that i mentioned because breakdown in communication occurs when we disregard other forms of knowledge that are inconvenient or messy to the ordered enlightenment era western mind or your american mind actually european mind more than anything so um, i'll give you a simple example in a lot of books of natural history um, or books of botany you'll find exquisite plates beautifully painted plates very often by local painters who remain unknown and unnamed and if you look at their early work human figures are present so-called pest species are present species that interact with that plant are present and as you see the longer they remain company painters the less you see all these elements they all begin to vanish and then you have this exquisite plate, but it's a plate of a dead plant that is now studied systematically and named with, you know, with very often Linnaean taxonomy. Um, but the name and the plate say nothing about biome, about original context, about the history and knowledge, indigenous knowledge around that species and how that species interacts with others as well. That was one thing. The second thing was that um, I also, my parents, um, left the city because it was so horrifying to their psyches, I think. And um, we actually grew up, not me a lot to a less, lesser degree, to be honest, um, but we actually lived in uh, part of the uh, jungles in, in, in Northern India, which is really the foothills of the Himalaya, known as the Babar area. And um, this is a place called Kaladungi. It's also a lot of, it's a wildlife corridor. So a lot of spe species um, travel through there uh, between the national parks, at least used to, um, this is in the 1980s. and. To keep us safe, well, to actually just also educate us, my parents taught us how to identify alarm calls. Um, so you always know if there's a leopard or a tiger or any such predator, you know, going through um, our land. And then we would also understand, is it hungry? Is it on the hunt? Is it a danger? Is it not? Um, is it mating season? Does it have cubs, et cetera, et cetera? So all the, all the risk factors could be weighed. And my sister, who was the youngest, was only six years old, and she understood this language. 
And often time for people like her and my brother who spend much more time on the land that I did, they learned this language really intuitively and really quickly. And they understood what calls meant. And for me later, because I gained most of my knowledge from books, not from real life experience, at least as a child, as a, as a voracious reader, I, I realized much later that um, there's most predators, especially raptors, have a particular frequency within which their hearing is very poor. And most alarm calls occur within that frequency. So species have actually adapted to, to sound alarm calls in frequencies that the predator cannot hear. And the alarm call will actually have information about the type of predator. So if you're a non-prey species, you could completely ignore the call. So all this knowledge I gained later, but the intuitive understanding of interspecies communication, because alarm calls are not only from birds, they, you have birds, monkeys, even fish can carry alarm calls, um, squirrels, everything, they pass on this information amongst each other. So here you have not only mammals, but other, other um, uh, um, creatures sharing information. And this, this so-called telegraph travels through the forest at about 170 kilometers per hour, way faster than any predator can. So it's one of the most sublime forms of communication. A single, uh, a, a single minute of this acoustic encounter can take um, months to decode because it's that rich. And a lot of that is breaking down because of habitat fragmentation as human noise infiltrates um, um, habitats, which we saw happening mm. firsthand where we lived. And we can see this almost everywhere. Um, roads are the worst culprit, of course. Um, and what happens then is you have this this uh, this uh, phenomenon called uh, feet of edge. Um, uh, it's, it's kind of it, it's, it edge habitat is when you bifurcate a habitat, it doesn't break up into two. It's not like you have two habitats now. The habitat actual habitat is shrunk even more. So even though it looks like a large green area, um, all along the edge, only very few species can survive. Um, because of everything from light pollution, noise, um, and so on. And I'm looking specifically at noise and human noise and how it interferes with um, communication between species. And that actually forms a big part of the film as well. Um, and when it comes to uh, um, the drawings, which are called a lim uh, liminal feet of edge, it actually refers to that act of, um, of fragmentation. And fragmentation of thought is something that has also occurred in the human mind and in, to quite a large extent, given that because of the proliferation of, of things that constantly demand our attention. Hmm. So, and I'm, I'm saying this as, a, as, a, as someone who grew up in the pre-digital age and I was able to complete a thought and I cannot complete a thought <laughs> as easily anymore. Um, I rarely complete my sentences as well. Um, and I mean, it's, it's very interesting how all of these things work. I mean, that's a, that's a very long discussion for another time as well. But all to say is that we're also, as a mammalian species, we are affected as well. And so I was also looking at all these things. And I, I, I felt that the drawings to me re represent, I mean, a lot of people would see them probably as journal pages. But to me, actually, they are fragmented thoughts. It's like when I get, I'm seized by a new bit of information that I've encountered. And I'm like, oh, I could build an entire thing around it. But it never happens because I'm immediately distracted by something else that demands my attention. So each one of those drawings actually represents an idea that could have been built to something really beautiful, but remained a mere fragment or um, a factoid or something like that. It's just one single, or sometimes a single poetic impulse, which then dies stillborn. It's just, it's actually, to me, they are little tragedies yeah. um, and that's why they're so bare and there's this this sort of you know these this large white empty space which to me is kind of like the whiteout that occurs in my brain sometimes when I'm overwhelmed with information finally the photographs <laughs> sorry I'm running to this um, <laughs> but I want to tie it all together um two transects the photographs actually represent um, they, they're quite obvious I think um in the sense where you can see the hierarchy of the botany the books of botany on top so it's, it's the way we look at the natural world through the knowledge we've been taught about it or the systems of looking that we've learned, whether in school or so on. We can't actually understand or look at the natural world um, and be inside of it. Even though we are part of it, we, we cannot feel that anymore. We cannot look at it that way anymore. So the transects are not only the images that occur mm. as dual, um, they, they, this, this dual conversation. It's mm. also the viewer looking at the photographs and being separate from them and trying to make sense of something and then drawing upon their own internal bodies of knowledge and saying, what could this possibly mean? 
and then either dismissing it as being in uh, another obtuse artwork or actually understanding that I cannot possibly comprehend and read everything within these images. The same way I can be in a forest and I cannot understand it the way perhaps at one stage we were able to as a species and still indigenous communities can as well. It's a knowledge that we've disregarded for so long that even if we were to relearn it, um, I don't know if we can actually live it. So it's again, I think to me, there's a kind of pathos to those works as well. Yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting. Um, again, we sort of come back to this theme of um, encountering communication breakdown. And um, you know, we could talk about that as the sort of fragmentation of habitats and uh, breaking up these, these chains of, of, um, of communication. Um, but also um, at the same time, this desire to communicate, this finding ways to communicate. And you mentioned the digital, you mentioned the digital as a, um, uh, uh, perhaps a device that's, that's fragmented um, human thought or attention, uh, but you also utilize the digital um, as a way of actually constructing this work. Absolutely. Um, because of the pandemic, I was unable to travel and film. So I actually drew on years of, of footage that I'd shot in, in almost as a kind of side um, thing that I would do. I'd be in a filming location, you know, for pulp or for whatever. And then, but I'd be so distracted, not I wouldn't say distracted, but I'd be drawn to these. Um, it could be the, it could be a, a, a horrible sodium lamp, um, orange sodium lamp behind a tree, a lone tree, it could be anything, but I'd be drawn to these trees being lit up at night, or I'd be drawn to certain natural um, spaces, maybe because I miss it so much living in Singapore. Anyway, this is years worth of footage that I just went through and also started putting together. So that's mm. one thing. But, but the aspect of digital communication is actually is present in the soundtrack. Mm. So what happened was, uh, during the pandemic, so my family is, we're all scattered, we're dispersed. Uh, my mother's in India, my brother is in South Africa, my sister's in the UK, and I'm in Singapore. So effectively across multiple continents as well. And for because of various reasons, we only sort of have each other. Um, and we're actually, we hardly get to meet, physically meet. And because we're all over the place and our schedules don't always match. Um, so we don't have things like family holidays and we just don't do that. Mm. We don't, we're not able to do it. But during COVID that became, that sense became even more acute. Like a lot of families went through this awful feeling of, 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 of time slipping by and losing, you know, that familiarity, that comfort yeah, that, with our families, right? In the case of my family, I realized that one of the ways in which my family members would be, I hope they'll forgive me for saying this, for being emotionally demonstrative was to share bird calls that they were recording because they, almost all of us were in lockdown at around the same time. And these are just calls recorded on their phones. Um, and sometimes, of course, there'll be a lot of ambient noise because almost all of them are surrounded by other forms of human habitation, roads, etc. But for instance, I noticed everyone recorded magpie robins um, and different types of magpie robins. And in our case, it's the Oriental magpie in Singapore and so on. And it's, it's one, it's a call that's very, very, I hear every time I walk, I used to walk my dogs um, in the evening and also even, even at home. And then I realized we were sharing these calls with each other and I'd, without any context, we just were, and it was one way in which I think we were reconnecting because whenever we're together, we'll, in, we'll gleefully interrupt each other to say, oh, did you hear that? Because it's a call of a certain bird and so on. Because that for us is, is such a precious, it's always been very precious. And it's something we're very aware of the fact that the absence of bird call is something we've noticed in a lot of places where there were a lot of different bird species earlier. Now, like in the, in the I've been living in the same place for 10 years, the same apartment. And um, now I have mostly uh, manas, but earlier, um, all the other bird species that were there, now I just hardly hear them anymore. Even if I don't get to see them, I know they're gone because I don't hear them. So sound actually is very often the canary in the coal mine, no pun intended. Mm -hmm. It's the first way in which we actually, our brains begin to feel that sense of loss, that breakdown in communication. And I realized my family was sharing these bird calls recorded over uh, on their phones and sharing them over WhatsApp, which further compresses and, and kind of really lowers the quality of the file. Um, but over WhatsApp, we were just constantly sharing this with each other. Um, and I realized it was a way to kind of reestablish a, a form of communication without saying it overtly. And that sort of also was, I think, a major impetus for me deciding, yes, I'm finally going to deal with this idea of interspecies communication, primarily with bird species. 
Um, I'm finally going to do this in the in this work, and this is something I'd wanted to do for a really long time, and I kept getting, you know, I kept sort of attending to pulp before anything else. Mm. So it's actually been a pleasure to finally do this work. So in a way, I think the COVID um, experience <laughs> has also uh, informed this work. It's taken away from it, but it's also allowed me to really address some some of the ideas that were very nascent. Yeah. Uh, and it's really interesting to you, uh, uh, going back to that, um, that choice of media expanding out from the film uh, yeah. with both the photographs and the drawings. You did touch um, a little earlier on, I guess, the function of these within the, um, within the project itself, but in terms of the relationship between each other, um, you've talked about the photographs being moments of uh, pause or frozen moments um, from the film and uh, the, the drawings as being points of elaboration. Would that be a correct way to consider it? Yes, yes, that's definitely one way to look at it. And the reason is points of elaboration is because the drawings, even though they, they, they're fragments, are actually also very cohesive in and of themselves. Each work can actually stand on its own. They also pair up really well. So mm. the fact is that they may be fragments, but they're not, de they're, they're not completely delinked from each other. Mm. They have the potential to open up brand new conversations and new connections and new forms of communication um, with each other. So in a sense, they do what the film can't and what the photographs can't. And that's always been the potential of drawing according to me, because it's the most, I, I would actually say, because drawing predates language. Before we had, we had um, you know, oral communication, we actually had very sophisticated drawing skills. So mm. I've always, and we can see this even when we look at uh, not just the infancy of our species, but if you look at human infants as well, mm. um, it's easier. Even we do it even now when we're trying to explain something. Um, um, we the act of gesturing also, by the way, um, is 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 I think also both is because we're used to drawing out what we want to say when we want to make a point. But um, we do find. Uh, uh, I mean, I've also looked at neuroscience of this, of course. And drawing to me is one of the is there's a primacy to it. It's mm. one of the first forms of it, earliest forms of communicating. Um, and I think that that's something that has not been as affected as we would imagine. Um, I'm also so happy again to be living in a time when drawing is celebrated in its own right as a very legitimate form of um, artistic expression. Um, and that's also why I, in almost all the exhibitions that I participate in, I, I include drawing, even if I'm, I'm often very unsure about my own <laughs> skill or I'm unsure about what um, uh, sort of, how can I say, um, I'm unsure about, you know, drawing being the right medium. I often feel that they always elaborate on and extend whatever's being said in, 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 in the other media that's on display. And in this case, the film is, of course, the heart of the work, naturally. Mm. But I think the drawings are not, are not footnotes. They are mechanisms to, to sort of, um, I mean, you can actually not watch the film. I'm not advocating people do, but if you, they choose not to watch it, they could actually sit in front of the drawings and listen to the film if they so mm. chose. And that would be an entire conversation or sets mm. of conversations, I feel. Yeah. No, I think it's really interesting. And, and I, I, I like the way you've pointed that out. I, I do think there is this, uh, we've ended up in a happy place with the Eng, uh, English language when it comes to the word drawing, which is a gerund, of course, but also a present participle. It's sort of something that's happening. We are drawing. And um, uh, there is a sort of a sense of action to that. Um, it's, it's very close in my mind to the word trace, um, which is both an action and a, and a remainder of an action. Um, and it, it is something that, that um, that does bring a little more life to your uh, to your project, and I think it's sort of a dialogue uh, in terms of the way that it's positioned across the space between these different elements that um, that, that maybe people can activate in their own ways. Um, thank you so much for um, talking to us, Shibigi. Um, it's been great to learn more about your work, um, and looking forward to enjoying it a little longer. Thank you so much, Ruben. And um, I want to also thank quickly thank the entire team um, um, from exhibitions to everybody who've been so amazing and supportive because it's been very hard to actually do something like this, um, the whole a APT exhibition, but also you know work with artists who are unable to actually visit, unable to do the work they originally propose sometimes. And I really appreciate the support and patience that you all have had. Um, I think this work is just it's just made of the right right time and it's also made for the right place so thank you again thanks Shubhiki. thank you